Welcome back to the Farah interview series where we are taking you behind the scenes at the International Ataxia Research Conference in Washington, D.C. Right now we are here with Dr. Merrick Naparella and Dr. David Corey who are going to tell us about ASOs. So first of all, before we get into ASOs and what that even is, why don't you give us a little uh, intro about who you are and how you guys came to collaborate on this these uh, compounds? Well, I'm, I'm David Corey. I'm in the Department of Pharmacology at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. My laboratory started working on these compounds probably in about 2015. And as our lab needed to achieve higher levels of sophistication, naturally, we turn to Merrick, who is one of the gurus in this field. And it's actually been a huge privilege to um, work with you. So uh, my name is Marek Napirala, uh, and I, I have been involved in, with working with, with Friedrich Ataxia for probably almost two decades now. Um, and our, our lab is focused entirely on, on free drugs, but we are no expert in, in um, ASOs, in oligonucleotides. Um, we collaborated, uh, we, we brought our expertise to, to the world's expert in oligonucleotides to David. So this is a merge of, of two things, the merge of expertise in oligonucleotides, which David's group uh, brings, and our expertise in, in free drugs and different free drugs models. And also I'll say, it was the Free Drugs Ataxia Research Alliance that actually brought us together, and they've been really good about facilitating these interactions. You're both presenting at IARC on um, ASOs, which is a nice um, abbreviation. Um, help us break that down, antisense oligonucleotides. What do those three terms mean? An antisense oligonucleotide is a synthetic piece of DNA. And the beauty of that is that you can make these small pieces of DNA to bind to basically anywhere, any piece of RNA inside your cell that you want. And because they can bind to any piece of RNA, they have the potential to change the expression of any gene. So, for example, in free drugs, ataxia, our goal is to increase expression of frataxin. How does an ASO accomplish increased gene expression? Well, that gets to the mechanism of the, the disease. Our theory is that by binding to the mutant RNA, we block the mutant RNA so that it cannot interfere with expression of the frataxin gene. So the frataxin gene is able to go back to normal and increase, express normal levels of frataxin. And in, in our gene, um, that mutant piece would be the trinucleotide expansion. Correct. So the approach that we're working on would apply to every patient who has the trinucleotide expansion. Is it too simplistic to say that an ASO is like taking a, a whiteout and, and whiting out the problem part of the gene? I mean, it's a little bit simplistic. We're not destroying the problem part. Mm -hmm. I think it's more, just think of it as blocking. Or covering it up. Covering it up, yeah. Okay. And when, in a, in a cell, DNA is two parts. RNA is what splits off. The antisense oligonucleotide, the ASO, is the other half that binds to that, that piece of RNA to block the, the part that we don't want expressed. Yes. Okay. How do you, it seems crazy, not that any of us are going to do this in our bathroom, but how do you make an ASO? Oh, I mean, it's made on a, it's made on a machine, and um, nowadays it can be made on ton scale. So making it isn't a problem. One of the beauties of this approach is that there's an entire industry that's been making these antisense oligonucleotides to intervene in other diseases. So all of the practical details for developing these drugs, like how to make enough of them, or how to make them so they'll be stable in the body, those problems have already been solved by other people. Um, <laughs> help us understand, if you would, Merrick, how, how, does, how does all of your research in this collaboration uh, relate to um, or ha how does it have an impact on Friedrich Ataxi, the, the people that are watching the video right now? So, um, I think that, the, first of all, it's a great collaborative effort of, of two labs with completely different expertise. And uh, what, we try to, what we try to bring is something which 
um, the technology which is known to work in other disorders. Mm -hmm. So we know that oligonucleotides have been around for quite some time. They have been in many clinical trials, but in the past few years, oligonucleotides therapies have been approved for treatments of different diseases, with I think the most spectacular being, being SMA. Yes. Um, so Nusineris yes. or Spinraza. Yes. So, so this is something which is very exciting because there is, a, there is a path forward fairly clear. We can see that those oligonucleotides can actually be applied to humans, that they are reasonably safe, that they, that they, that they improve the patient's life. So we see it an example of other diseases. Why not to, uh, to put a big effort and try for free drugs? So, um, just mm -hmm. getting down to brass tacks. Uh, how do you get an ASO into your body? Is it a, a pill you take, an injection you have, an IV? Okay. It would be an injection, so it would probably an uh, intraspinal injection. But that's what, what's already been done with SMA, and mm -hmm. these are long-lasting, so you might only have to do them two or three times a year. All right. There we go. So, you know, the end goal is to get have that injection, right, and do it three times three times a year or whatever. What what we think is the biggest hurdle in that process and just what does our process kind of look like from where we are now? Okay. Yes, right. I the biggest hurdle, at least from my perspective, is actually a practical one. The major companies in this industry have been successful and now have lots of projects to work on. And what our goal has been is to do the research that has the potential to produce the results to get them to say, yes, we want to take this on as a research development project. Um, so for example, we want to make compounds more potent. And especially we want to show results in you know, animals. It's been made clear to us that those are two of the areas where we need to make progress. Yeah, I think I, I absolutely agree with that. This is this is the biggest uh, issue. The other is also models and free drugs. We we have animal models which are appropriate, but they are not uh, the best representation of the disease. Um, the mouse models we have. So some some of the hurdles come with with what we call a, a therapeutic range in those those animals and observance of the of the changes in animal the improvements. So. These are also problems which may, may show up. Yeah. Um, I've seen pictures of uh, FA uh, <clears throat> patients, their families, touring your labs. In fact, some of the people watching the video might, right now may have been through your labs. Why is it important to have uh, the community kind of engage with you in, in the lab setting like that? Well, I mean, I can't speak for you know community members and why they feel it's important. I think it's very important for the community to engage with basic scientists to remind us that our work has the potential to affect real people. Yeah. And I know it's been inspiring to the people in, in, in my laboratory. It reminds them of why they need to be working on weekends, why they need to work hard, and why we need to be focused on real goals and not just the kind of goals that might advance an academic career. In our case, uh, we, you know, I, I first time met Carl probably in 2007 when he was doing his first ride at yeah, Axia. Yeah, when you I was, were one of the first scientists that I ever met. Yeah, and we're going to you, you were one of the first Friedrichs patients that I met. I think I met a couple before on one of the conferences. And, and it was still in, in Texas, and you know, um, it's 2007, and that's, that's mm -hmm. how, how it started. When I established my own lab, I decided we need to, we need to do it on a periodic, periodic basis. So we actually have one or two meetings a year when we invite patients. And every graduate student, every postdoc, every person in the lab I needs to know that the free drugs is not what you work on. You know, you work on the tubes. You have the tubes labeled FRDA, FXN. What does it mean? That means nothing. The GAA repeats means nothing until you see the patient and you see what the patients are actually going through. How the disease look like? The disease actually has a face. It's not a tube. It's not GAA repeats only. So that's very important for for everybody in the lab to know that that the goal is actually real. It's not something imaginary. It's not just science. Yeah. Well, we all appreciate your hard work, and yeah. it, it is meaningful to us that you spend your lives working on cures for us and our families. Absolutely. So, Dr. Naparella, Dr. Corey, thank you very much for your time this morning. Uh, we're looking forward to your presentations at IARC 2019. Uh, for the rest of you, uh, tune in next time. 
Uh, keep on checking in on the Farah Facebook page, on Farah Twitter, on Farah LinkedIn, and the Farah YouTube channel. Uh, our next interview will be with Dr. Sanjay Bidi Chindani and Lane Rodden regarding epigenetic silencing. So tune in for that. You don't want to miss it. Thank you all very much. Pretty impressive, right? <laughs> <laughs> it is. You got a very loud clap. I, well, I like it. You know, it's uh, the cupping. <laughs> All right.